Hey everybody, how you doing? Teching and Barry back again, and no more apples! Alright, I'm done with the apples, not a single apple is anywhere near me right now, okay? I'm sorry to start the video off like this, because if you've never watched my channel before, or if you clicked on this video just to find out about something involving One Piece, you're probably thinking I'm a crazy person right now. Like, wait, why, why is he talking about apples? I clicked on a One Piece video, right? Oh no, you did! We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. It's just, yeah, why am I talking about apples? Because I'm not gonna be eating any more apples. Now, I do happen to have these bananas here. Actually, no, 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 no. We're done with the fruit, okay? We're already doing the alphabet of animal facts. We're not gonna go down the alphabet of fruit. I don't even think that would work. Are there any fruits that start with the letter Q or X? It would be doomed to fail from the beginning. Anyway, it doesn't matter, right? We're done with the fruits, all right? Now, today we're gonna be talking about things in One Piece that weren't originally supposed to be in One Piece. And I must thank Sandman AP over on Twitter for posting a uh, post about this. Um, if you don't know, Sandman man AP. He's pretty cool. He's a person over on Twitter that posts a lot of stuff involving Oda's, like, interviews. So, typically when it comes to, like, me, stuff that's, like, in the Tonko Bonds, like the SBSs and the data books, that stuff is usually translated by a bunch of different sources and you find out. But when it comes to, like, interviews and things that Oda does, or maybe not Oda specifically, maybe just his editors and other people at, like, Shonen Jump that release some things, that stuff's not always immediately translated, and so I have to thank Sandman AP for doing that, because the bulk of One Piece information that deals with that realm of, like, interviews I usually get from his Twitter page, okay? So I'll leave the links and stuff all down below, at SandmanAP, go give him a follow, really cool dude, all right? So yesterday, he posted this. This was a list of things in the One Piece story that Oda did not plan out beforehand, okay? And that could be for a number of reasons. Maybe he just literally did not think of it, and he, tr he decided to incorporate it later. Um, or it could have been, like, an editor, you know, changing things around, or an editor, you know, maybe giving Oda some advice, like, hey, maybe you should do this instead of this. And, you know, a lot of people get, I think, upset over that sometimes when editors influence the manga. Uh, it's like, oh, you're taking away the agency from the mangaka. You know, the mangaka should be able to just write the entire story the way that they envision it. Well, the thing is kind of like, sometimes editor interference can actually be a good thing. Like, a, a perfect example of this, something that a lot of people probably know about at this point, is in Dragon Ball Z, or Dragon Ball the manga, but Dragon Ball Z, the anime, um, when Toriyama originally introduced the androids uh, as Dr. Jiro and, you know, Android 19, so Android 19 and 20, those were supposed to be, like, the main threats of that arc, I believe. Those were supposed to be the main androids, but then the editor at the time was like, hey, this is, like, some mime and some old geezer, you know? Like, I don't think that's really gonna respond very well. You should change him out. And so then Toriyama introduced Android 17 and 18. And even then, the editor was like, oh, okay, so now the enemies are just some punk kids? You know, get to this Cell guy already, and even after he got to Cell, we had to hurry up through the transformations to get to Perfect Cell. Now look, you could think about some parallel universe where Toriyama had 100% complete control over the Dragon Ball manga, and things might have been different, but every bit as good, but I don't know about you, but I love the Cell and Android saga in Dragon Ball. Like, I think it's really, really solid, and a lot of people feel the same way, and it would not be in that exact configuration if it wasn't for the editors giving, you know, pieces of advice and, like, their input to Toriyama at the time. And that's kind of how Shonen Jump works, right? I mean, an editor's job is essentially to, like, look at the material that the mangaka is creating, and not just for what the audience might actually like, but also from a marketing standpoint, because this is a business after all. So some of it might be like, hey, if you're planning on killing off this character, or you're planning on changing this character to this, or you're planning on doing this with this location. Maybe it's like, like, maybe that's not as marketable as doing this instead. So, there's a lot of stuff that goes into this, and I don't know if it's, like, I, I don't know everything. I don't know if it's, like, Oda is obligated to make a decision, if there's some way that, like, an editor could tell him to do something, and Oda's like, no, I don't want to do that, and the editor could maybe go over Oda's head to, like, higher pay grade and be like, no, this is not a good decision, you have to do this. I don't know how it works. I really don't. But this is just a simple list, and this doesn't even include everything, but this is a simple list of things in One Piece that were not intended from the beginning, that Oda did not think of at the beginning. You could say this is because of, you know, editor interference, or it's just Oda thought of something better as he was going along. Being a mangaka is kind of like being a DM for D&D &D as well. It's just like, well, I didn't think about this at first, but I could make it work, <laughs> you know? Okay. So the first thing on this list is Vivi being a princess, all right? Now, this list doesn't give any elaboration on exactly, like, what else Oda was intending for this character, so 
like, even if Vivi was intended to be a character at the beginning, what goals that Oda might have thought for Vivi at that time, we don't really know. But the idea is that Vivi was not planned on being a princess at the start of the story. Because remember, Vivi was originally Miss Wednesday. So it's possible that, like, Oda might have really just used her as just a small-time villain, you know, as a low-ranking member of Baroque Works for the Straw Hats to face off against when they first arrived in the Grand Line at the Laboon arc and then the Whiskey Peak arc. And might have been an editor or something that's like, hey, do something with these characters. Don't just make them random villains. Have some higher stakes here, okay? Now that leads to a bunch of other questions like tangents and stuff. Like, okay, if Vivi wasn't originally planned on being a princess, then how would the whole Alabasta arc have went? Um, I, I kind of feel like Oda intended Luffy to fight Crocodile, but it might have been a completely different situation on getting the Straw Hats to Alabasta to fight against Crocodile. Maybe Crocodile you know, would have been a, in a completely different location or had a completely different setup to his character that wasn't really closely connected to Vivi in that regard, okay? However, I will say this, even though Oda did not originally plan on Vivi being this princess of this kingdom, he did an amazing job of spinning it because not only was Vivi very integral during the Alabasta arc itself, and then, you know, her tearful goodbye as she decides to stay behind in her kingdom to lead her people, but also way further down the story, in Reverie, it becomes very important because she goes to the Reverie, so we get to kind of see what's going on through her perspective. And then also, Eam seems to have some interest in Vivi as well as he's staring longingly at her picture. All right? If Vivi was not a princess, if Vivi was just Miss Wednesday and that was it, then we wouldn't have this storyline going on right now. So I guess that's the really, uh, the good tall tale sign of a great author. Not just a great mangaka, but a great author in general of any work of fiction. It's like, okay, I have to do something I didn't originally plan, but let's just not make it a one and done. Let's just not do this and just never reference it again. Let's build it to something. So it's like, okay, I didn't plan on Vivi becoming a princess, but she's a princess now. So what else, what, what other opportunities are opened up in the story because she's a princess? And going to Reverie and Eam taking interest in her and everything like that is an opportunity. So go ahead. That's awesome, Oda. And I want to see where that's going to go. And we don't even know what's up with Vivi right now. She was apparently kidnapped or something. She might be in the dungeons of Marijua. She might be with Eam right now. We have no idea what's going on with her. So the whole thing kind of predicated on the fact that she is a princess and that wasn't even something that was planned at the beginning. So there you go. Also, this is something, it's not on the list, but I feel like a lot of people know this. One Piece was originally only planned to run for five years. Like, that was Oda's, like, original goal when he started it. And that makes sense because when it comes to new manga in Shonen Jump, you're kind of on the chopping block, you know? It's not very... Uh, often that manga continue on for multiple years or decades, as is the case with One Piece. That's a very rare thing to actually happen. So it would make sense that a mangaka getting started in that field would not plan on, like, making a story that's going to last 20-plus years, because that's just not that's just not feasible at the beginning. Now, of course, it worked for One Piece. You know, this entire third shelf I have behind me right now is just nothing but One Piece. You know, over 100 volumes so far. So, yeah, but at the beginning, it would made sense that Oda would have been like, hey, you know what, I'm just going to do this story. Hopefully I can have it run in Shonen Jump for five years to get my whole story out, right? So that would have been that would have been an interesting other parallel universe to see um, that One Piece ends after five years. But yeah, I don't even know how you could, you would have to cut so much stuff out to make it make sense and still reach the end point, but I don't know. Anyway, the next thing is Shanks appearing at the Marine Ford War. Now I can kind of see this one, all right, because... There wasn't really a lot of setup for that. There wasn't like, you know, the only thing we got with that was that it was stated that Shanks had a run in with Kaido's crew the day before Marineford. And I think Oda put that in there just to say, like, okay, Whitebeard's getting involved in Marineford. These are two great powers of the world clashing, a Yonko and the Marines, okay? So there's a lot of other powers in the world that are going to get knocked off of balance because of that interaction. So it's like, what about the other Yonko? You know, what about Kaido? What about Shanks? It's like, well, Kaido is stopped by Shanks. And so that makes sense. So there was a little bit of mention of Shanks there, but it was never established that, like, Shanks was going to appear at Marine Ford. It was never like hinted at or anything or even implied before this, okay? And just like the wildest theories. Maybe somebody thought of it, but you know, I was reading One Piece Weekly back then, and I can tell you when Shanks showed up at the war, that was a holy shit kind of moment, okay? That was 
I go, okay, holy crap. I know this is a war against Whitebeard and the Marines, but Shanks just showed up. Shit just got real, okay? Like, yeah, remember that? If you were reading One Piece Weekly back then, remember when Shanks showed up. That was the biggest just, like, mic drop ever, okay? It was like, okay, war's over, everybody. <laughs> War's over. Head on over to the uh, the commissary table. Pick up your hundred bucks and be on your way. War's over. Okay. Oh man. All right. So anyway, yeah. I honestly think maybe Oda, maybe didn't like write himself into a corner, but he had to come up with some means to just end the war fast. Okay, because. You know, at this point, we have Whitebeard there, we have Blackbeard there, you know, Whitebeard's dead, Ace is dead, okay? And it's like, how is this going to end by any other means? Because it's probably just going to devolve into just, just a straight-up melee between the Marines, the Whitebeard pirates, the other pirates that were there, and Blackbeard's crew, right? It's just going to result in a massive melee, and maybe Oda thought, like, okay, if that were to happen, then just a lot of people would die. And I don't want, like, a lot more Marines would die, like Vice Admirals and stuff. How would I get Blackbeard's crew out of this in One Piece? Because Blackbeard's supposed to be, like, the main villain of, you know, at the end of One Piece, and right? And so it's like Sengoku and Garp are there. Do you think Sengoku and Garp are just going to let them go? You know what I mean? So it, it was probably the right call there to have Shanks show up and just block a kainu shot and just stand there with his crew and be like war's over get going you know um it's you know remember the fallen you know whitebeard and ace and everybody else that has died in this war um if you want to continue to fight i'm here but get going basically that that's how it all went down um so, yeah, that I can kind of see as sort of something that Oda might have pulled out of his ass, but it was so epic anyway, I don't even care. <laughs> you know, it makes sense. It wasn't like something that doesn't make any sense for Shanks to show up. Shanks does have a vested interest in this, right? And Shanks might be playing a long game here. Once again, Oda's like, oh, I didn't plan on Shanks being there at the beginning, but now he was there, and him being there is going to imply some things for his character later down the line. Might be something like that, right? Okay. And also, Shanks doesn't get utilized that much in One Piece anyway. So I feel like with something like that, only utilizing Shanks for really big moments in the story, that's perfect, right? That's like perfect right there, okay? Shanks showing up at the very beginning to give Luffy the hat in the flashback. Then he shows up to clash with Whitebeard. We see him a few other times randomly, like hanging out with Mihawk. But then, boom, shows up at the war. And then, boom, shows up at the reverie. That's how you utilize a character like Shanks, okay? Uh, next up, Ace being Roger's son. Okay, I can actually see this one because here's something that's really funny, all right? If you look at the way Roger was designed at the beginning of One Piece, right here, how he appears in the beginning, you know, like, wealth, fame, power, Goldie, Roger achieved this and everything else the world had to offer, blah, 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 okay? He looks very different, not very different, but he looks different than he did in Odin's flashback that we got. You could almost say that Oda retroactively changed his appearance to make him look more like Ace, because Ace is his son. So obviously there'd be a family resemblance. Because if you look at Ace in his first appearance, and you look at Roger in his first appearance, yeah, I mean, there's similarities there. Like, they both have black hair, but, like, they don't immediately scream father and son. But if you look at Ace and then look at Roger recently, you can see the family resemblance right there, right? And then he has the freckles from his mom, uh, who Rouge didn't show up until it was revealed that, you know, Ace was Roger's son, okay? So that's a big one. That's a really big one there. I don't really know what Oda's thought process there was. Um, did he originally intend for Ace and Luffy to be blood brothers? To be like, well, not just blood, we're blood brothers in a war, kind of, but also like literally blood brothers, like related, you know, the same father. Um, because that was the impression I kind of got at Alabasta when they were first introduced. So you could say that was just Oda playing the long game there. Because we don't know when he made these decisions. We know it wasn't originally planned for Ace being Roger's son, but when did Oda make that decision? Did he make that decision right before Marine Ford? Did he make that decision during Annie's Lobby? Did he make that decision, you know, after Ace was already drawn in Alabasta, but maybe like during Alabasta, Oda had an idea, or maybe the editor told him something, and it is like, Ace 
Reese is going to be Roger's son. Like, whoa, yeah, let's do that instead. You know, we don't know when he found out about this stuff, but the implication is like, hey, going back through the story and leaving it a little bit open-ended, it was never directly stated, yes, like Ace and Luffy were stated to be brothers during Alabasta, but it was never really established further than that, like who their father was, who their mother was. It wasn't gone into any more greater detail. And so Oda took it the way of like, hey, you know, brothers doesn't necessarily have to be the same parents or the same, like at least one parent. It could be something else. Like, like you went through something together and they shared sake cups and they became brothers that way. And then also Sabo threw that as well, like a third brother, because it was never mentioned there was only two of them. They only mentioned that they, hey, me and Ace are brothers. And that was it. It was never mentioned that there was a third one. So that's how you get Sabo in there, right? So yeah, Ace being Roger's son, I can definitely see that because if you go, if, if Oda stayed with Roger's original design throughout the entire story, then there wasn't that much of a family resemblance, but now there is because of that reason, okay? So I could kind of see that. Next is Lucci being a villain. I can kind of see this one as well, because during Water 7, we get introduced to these really strong members of Galila, these really strong shipwrights. We got Polly there, we got Tilestone, that's the guy that yells at everything. We got Lulu, who has like the, you know, every time he, you know, moves his cowlick, it pops up somewhere else on his body. So that was actually, that's actually one of my favorite, like, random background running gags in One Piece. Just, just Lulu has this cowlick, and every time he pushes it down, it shows somewhere else up, that doesn't make any sense. Like, sometimes they'll just push it down, and it appears on the other side of his head. One time he pushes it down and it appears on his mustache. One time he pushes it down and it appears on his arm. One time he pushes it down and it appears on somebody else's arm. And it's just, it's the funniest thing ever. It's just in this background thing that Oda's just having fun with. But um, here with Lucci being the villain, it might have been something where like Lucci was just intended to be a shipwright. And maybe the editor or something said, hey, we need to have more villains. And Oda's like, all right, I have all these shipwrights that I wasn't going to do anything crazy with. And he's like, well, you know, imagine if he decided on Polly instead. What if he decided on Polly becoming basically Lucci's character in the story? So Polly was the one that fought against Luffy in the final battle um, at Eni's lobby. That'd be really cool. But Lucci, I feel, works. In fact, I even have this idea, and this is so trippy now to think of this like alternate universe of how things could go. But I honestly think what if it was like Odo was drawing all of the Galley Law members and he draw Lucci as basically a villain because if you look at Lucci he does kind of look evil like just a little bit you know it's just I think it's the goatee that does it it's the goatee that kind of does it but it's just like yeah I'm gonna draw this character Lucci and make him seem like he's evil but the twist is he's actually not right but then he decided Ah, screw it, I'll just make him evil. You know, I'll just make him a villain all, all together. Why not, right? Lucci's the one that I think fits into that role the most. Um, but you could have had fun with Polly. I think you could have spun it well. Like, Polly was kind of this, like, goofy character, you know, chased after by lone sharks. He kind of has some, like, comedic moments with, like, Nami and Khalifa there. Like, oh, you indecent woman, please cover up. But then it's revealed, I'm actually a Machiavellian schemer. It's like, whoa, okay, he pulled an Aizen, essentially. I, I could kind of see that with Polly, but... Yeah, I'm glad Lucci ended up being the main villain of Eni's Lobby. Lucci is a very fan-favorite kind of character for that. Um, next up is the Drum Rockies looking like a cherry blossom tree. Yeah, I mean, that kind of seems like something that might have just been tacked on near the end of the arc to have a really cool aesthetic. Uh, because the entire arc, you had, like, Hero Look talking about cherry blossoms and how they can kind of, like, cure any illness and stuff, you know? But you don't really know where that's going to go. Like, is he inventing some kind of serum made out of cherry blossoms? Like, you can interpret it a few different ways. And so the way that it is interpreted is that, no, the sight of cherry blossoms can actually uplift the heart's of the people on that frozen island of Drum Island where it, it's never spring. So it's kind of depressing to always be stuck in winter. And so Hero Luck was like, I will make cherry blossoms bloom in you know, in this frozen country. And at the end, with the, the drum Rockies resembling a cherry blossom tree, which I didn't even get at first, by the way, when I first saw that happen, probably way back in the Four Kids era, I didn't actually make the connection that it's supposed to be the trunk of a tree and then, you know, the leaves, the cherry blossoms, you know, actually falling off of the tree because I was an idiot, okay? But maybe it could have been really just like Oda designed the Drum Rockies because the name of it is Drum Island, so they just look like drums. And then when he did the cherry blossom thing, he's like, oh, wait a second. The mountains also look like tree trunks. 
and cherry blossoms grow on tree. Oh my god, that's perfect, you know? You know, maybe that's how it went. Like, oh, that worked out perfectly. I didn't even plan that from the beginning. Okay, whatever. Cool, whatever. That's more of just an aesthetic thing, but it's it's interesting. Uh, Doflamingo and Corazon having a blood relationship. Um, this is something that I don't even really know how you would have handled this because this is established very early on. This whole thing is established during Dressrosa. So maybe you could have had something like Doflamingo's character obviously was, you know, created long before Dressrosa. Doflamingo appears way back at the beginning of the story, not the beginning of the story, but right after Alabasta. So r relatively early on in One Piece. Um, Maybe Oda had a plan of like, okay, Doflamingo is going to be the ruler of this island and the Straw Hats are going to have to go to it and fight. And maybe Doflamingo has the backstory with this Marine that tried to bring him in, but he killed the Marine. Maybe that's what all that Corazon was at the beginning, all that Roshinate was. He was just like a Marine that was undercover and trying to bring Doflamingo in, trying to infiltrate his crew. Um, not necessarily a blood relative of Doflamingo himself. And so obviously by the time Dressrosa rolled around, this was already cemented because we get the backstory with Doflamingo first with his brother Roshinate there, and then later we get the backstory with Law that involves Roshinate meeting Law and becoming like his big brother kind of figure, and then eventually his tearful death at um, Swallow Island as Doflamingo, his brother, shoots him, which also ties back into like Doflamingo killed his dad, and so now he kills his brother, and it's very sad and poetic, but it's there, and you know, Law manages to live on with the op-op fruit and everything. So, yeah, I, I think... I mean, like, you could have probably had an interesting story there with uh, Roshinate just being an undercover Marine, and that's it. But adding that extra layer of giving Doflamingo a brother, that also adds to a whole new layer of this by creating the whole nature versus nurture thing. Where, you know, it's like it's the way that you're raised depending on how you end up. You know, because Doflamingo was kind of like really messed up seemingly from birth. He really subscribed to that whole like Tenryubito thing. Even though his dad and his mom and his brother weren't like that, he was. So that's a question, like a, like a philosophical question you can kind of bring up. Philosophical and I guess psychological as well. But then you have Roshinati that grew up by being raised by Sengoku mainly and becoming a Marine. And he was the complete opposite of Doflamingo. So that brings some extra layers and depths to both characters, I feel. So I think that was a really good call there. I feel like that was something that wasn't just decided upon like last minute. That was something Oda probably came up with, you know, before Dressrosa really got going. Maybe he decided on it during Punk Hazard or Fishman Island or something like that. But at any rate, that was a really good call on uh, whoever's decision that was. If it was a decision of the editor, good on the editor. If it was decision on Oda, good on Oda. There we go. Oh, or maybe, I mean, I should also say that's probably a collaborative effort a lot. I'm making it sound like the editor just, you know, goes up to Oda and just barks orders at him, like, Oda, do this instead, and then just storms out of the room and, you know, slams the door. Um, it's probably a collaborative thing, I would imagine, a lot. Like, there's meetings they probably go through, you know, where maybe the editor is like, hey, Oda, maybe it would be a better idea for you to do this instead of this, and they actually sit down and talk about bounce ideas off of each other on how it's going to go because the editors are also privy to information that only Oda knows as well like I'm sure there's like a few people out there that probably know how the One Piece story is supposed to end and the editors knowing that it might be a thing you know I don't know that for certain um, but even if it's not like the end end of the story you know, Oda might, you know, give them his notes and stuff of things that's going to happen later in the manga after Wano, for example. You know, like, for example, if the Straw Hats are going to go to Elbaf after Wano, I'm sure Oda's current editor is already well aware of that and has, like, notes and, like, what Oda is planning on during that arc, you know, and so they can bounce ideas off of each other to see how it would really work best for the magazine, I guess. Um, the, this is something I actually already knew prior, um, the seven warlords appearing in the manga, One Piece was originally supposed to be a story to fight Yonko, not the Shishibukai, or not the warlords. This makes sense in a story that's really, like, like, let's say One Piece did end in five years. That makes more sense to have the Yonko just cut to the chase and be the main villains of the story, right? Like, if One Piece is only gonna last five years, okay, you have the Straw Hat Pirates getting strong, here are the Yonko that are currently in charge of the Grand Line that are ruling the world, defeat the Yonko, find the One Piece, end of story, right? You wouldn't really have time to introduce other uh, villainous, you know, groups at that point, right? Not all of the warlords are villainous, but you know what I mean. 
So maybe when the story began to seem like it was gaining traction, not just gaining traction, but it was actually very popular and people were really responding well to One Piece. Like they realized, like when Shonen Jump realized they basically had a gold mine here with this One Piece thing, okay? It's like this Oda guy seems to know what he's doing. This is selling like hotcakes. Maybe at that point when they maybe told Oda like, hey, this is going really, really well. Keep on doing what you're doing. Maybe this can go longer than five years, you know, maybe at that point was when Oda kind of decided, hey, maybe we should do something a little bit more than just Yonko. Maybe Yonko should be like the final threat that the Straw Hats have to face. Well, if that's the case, I need to introduce another threat that'll be honestly the primary threat of the first half of the Grand Line, Paradise, okay? The Warlords, there's still stuff going on with the Warlords, but we're kind of past the point in the story where the Straw Hats are facing off against Warlords as the primary threat. I feel like that was Doflamingo's kind of like last hurrah. Like, Doflamingo was essentially like the final boss of the Warlords that the Straw Hats had to face. Because I don't see the Straw Hats all going up against Mihawk, or Boa, or even Weevil, Buggy, maybe. <laughs> yeah, you know, Kuma, something else going on with him, right? So I could feel like, okay, well, let's do the Yonko for the New World Saga and the Warlords for the Paradise Saga. Let's have that as, like, the main setup, okay? Because the Straw Hats had to face off against Crocodile and then Moria and then Kuma. Um, Kuma was an ally at the end of the day, but they still had to, like, face off against him. Like, at the time, we didn't know that, so we thought, like, oh, man, this is just a straight-up, like, threat that the Straw Hats have to face at Sabaody. Uh, an admiral plus a warlord, um, you know, and then later Luffy does have to encounter Boa, and they were enemies at first, but then they become allies and stuff like that. Um, the whole thing with Mihawk and Zoro, that was very powerful at the beginning of the story. So Oda's still planning on doing stuff with the warlords, but the system has been abolished now, so the direction he's taking it is something different. Honestly, you could really have a lot of the warlords, and some of the warlords are allies. You know, Mihawk, I would say, is an ally of Zoro. Boa is definitely an ally of Luffy. Kuma is an ally, provided he gets his memories and stuff back, right? Um, so you could twist this a bunch of different ways where the Straw Hats team up with some of the Warlords to go fight the Yonko now. And it would make perfect sense. And it's just, it's just the sheer length of One Piece that's really crazy because nothing really feels rushed in that regard. It's like Luffy fought against Crocodile way back in like 2003, 2002, whenever that battle happened, okay? And then they became allies during Marineford, and if Crocodile were to show up again right now and join forces with the Straw Hat crew, that would not feel contrived, that would not feel like, oh, he was a villain, now he's an ally. It's like, no, I mean, like, it's been a long time, so I, you could see that. It's like a very natural natural kind of progression, I would say. Um, but yeah, it just, in a story that's only five years, the Yonko being the main villains and that's it, makes perfect sense. A story that is 23 plus years, you could see that there have to be more groups involved in all this, okay? Ah, uh, this is a good one. The Supernova still surviving in the New World. Oda thought about half of them would have dropped out already. You know what? I did too. I honestly thought that when the Supernovas, when their that big group was introduced at Sabaody, uh, nine members, not including Luffy and Zoro, because Luffy and Zoro are obviously part of the Straw Hats, the main cast. Nine members of those Warlords, uh, not the Warlords, the uh, Supernovas. I thought a good chunk of them would have just fallen off, and I feel like in the hands of another writer, they would have. You know, I feel like if it's just like, okay, here's a big group of characters, we cut to the new world, oh, yeah, Apu and a Rouge and Bonnie, they're all, they're all gone, they're all defeated. And honestly, when Bonnie was captured by Blackbeard and then Aki Inu at the end of the first half of One Piece, I thought that that, that was the setup. I thought it was just like, oh, Bonnie is the first supernova to bite the dust, as it were. And now, you know, we cut to the future, we cut to the two-year time skip, it's going to be revealed that, like, Apu dropped out and a Rouge dropped out and maybe Hawkins dropped out and stuff. Obviously, keep Law and Kid, um, you know. But the idea that they are all still active and they're all still doing stuff also works really well as well, you know? It's just like, they weren't immediately, I mean, they might have been immediately defeated or had some really bad uh, injuries at the beginning of their adventure in the New World. Look at Kid, I mean, he lost an arm. Um, but that doesn't mean they're just going to give up right away. They're going to continue on. And if you are going to have the, the uh, I keep saying Warlords, even if you are going to have the Supernovas drop out, 
like, let's see that on screen. Let's see that in the pages of One Piece. Let's just not do that, you know, off panel or whatever. Like, oh yeah, by the way, uh, Beiji just decided to stop being a pirate all of a sudden and went back to being a mafia boss in the West. You know, we wouldn't have had Beiji during, you know, Totland and stuff. And, you know, I gotta say, I like some supernovas more than others. Probably my least favorite supernova right now is easily a poo. I don't even think that's hard. You know, a, a Rouge, I actually want to see more from him. We haven't really seen a lot from a Rouge. A Poo's not really my favorite character right now, but at least they're giving him something to do in Wano. And after the events of Wano, if you just want to have a Poo quit then and be like, you know what, I'm done with this, and he just leaves, I'd be like, okay, at least we got to see the build up to that. It wasn't just off screen or whatever. So I could see that definitely. Um, and, and going along with the supernovas, this is another one I did know. Law being an important character. Oda thought Kid would become an important character, though, but not, like, lost so much. Like, and I think I could kind of see that, too. I could see him drawing the supernovas and drawing uh, Eustace Kid's character. And it's like, oh, he's like a badass punk rocker from, like, the 80s. He's got the hair. He's got goggles. He controls magnetic forces. And he's just like, wow. And he don't care about anything. Like, he'll burn a town down. He'll stab a, he'll stab a dude. He doesn't care. It's like, this is the guy. This is the guy that's going to be the new favorite character in the in the manga right and then i'm sure i mean he gave law a very specific design and personality as well um so i can't say that he just thought that law was just not going to be like relevant at all but i guess he definitely thought that kid was basically going to be the law of the story and it kind of twisted and flipped Whereas right now in the story, Law is easily one of the most popular characters. Like, raise your hand if Law is, like, your favorite character in One Piece. I don't, well, my favorite character is Frankie and then Robin, but certainly my favorite Supernova. Okay, raise your hand. That's a, that's a loaded question. Favorite character in all of One Piece. I understand that. Okay, raise your hand if Law is your favorite Supernova. Is your favorite Super Rookie. Yeah. I mean, he's he's a lot of it. And it's like, I think it's the hat, mainly. I honestly think it's the hat. The hat is pretty cool. The hat and the tattoos. The tattoos are pretty sweet as well. So, his design is cool as shit. Uh, plus the goatee. I mean, everything about his design is really cool. Everything about Law's design just screams, like... He's a hipster hanging out in a coffee shop in Seattle writing, like, poetry. <laughs> but... It works for some reason. I don't know. That his devil fruit is really cool, and his backstory is really cool, and the way he talks is really cool, and he's best friends with a polar bear, and that's really cool, and he's in a submarine, and that's really cool, and he has he's a doctor, and that's really cool. <laughs> you know, it's just everything's really cool. And with Kid, it's like, yeah, he looks cool. I don't think he looks as cool as Lyra does, but he looks cool, but we just don't know that much about his backstory. We don't really know more about him. And maybe Oda planned on it, but maybe... I, I feel like this is the editor 100%, though. I feel like the editor might have come to Oda and been like, hey, after Sabaody was over, like, hey... Trafalgar Law, he's testing, like, really well. Like, the fans seem to really like him. And Oda was like, oh, really? Well, I really wanted to do more stuff with Kid. I, I really wanted to focus on his character the most out of the Supernovas. And the editor's like, no, no, focus on Law. When the new world starts after the time skip, you get Law into this story as quick as possible. Like, all right. And I'll tell you what, once again, I remember reading One Piece Weekly, and that chapter, when they're at Punk Hazard and Smoker knocks on the door and Law opens it wearing that badass trench coat and the, the hat, the updated hat and I'm just like, woo! Law's back! You know, like <laughs> imagine that same scene but imagine it was Kid that answered the door. I mean, it would still have been like whoa Eustace Kid's answering the door, okay but it was like, whoa, Law! Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> Everybody loves Law. I don't know what to say. I still gotta do Law Week at some point. That's a running gag on my channel that might never happen, but I gotta do Law Week at some point. All right, all right, here's what you do. Make this easy for me. Go down into the, in the comments and type out seven ideas for videos that I could do about Law for a Law Week that I haven't done already. That's the main problem why Law Week hasn't happened, okay? Because I've already done videos about his Oppie Oppie no me. I made like three or four videos about the Oppie Oppie no me. I've made a video about his sword. I've made, I made like two or three videos just about his character itself. I made a video about his awakening. So it's like, 
How am I going to cobble together seven videos for law that I haven't already addressed in other series? I do have two. I have two ideas. One on the Polar Tang, which is his submarine ship, and one on the law light novels that exist, because there's law light novels, in case you didn't know. So addressing those two. But, like, I guess I could break up the light novel videos into more than one. But I, I need law video ideas. If you give me enough law video ideas, then I can make law week. So let's, let's try that. Let's make it work. Let's make this a collaborative effort. Okay, cool. All right. Um, and if I do, do use your video concept idea, I will give you a shout out. That's how this works. Okay, so yeah, go give me law video ideas and we can maybe call. You don't have to give me all seven at once, but if everybody gives me law video ideas, like, like that's a good one. I can cobble them together into like a Frankenstein list and like, okay, there's seven and here's the people that gave them recommendations for and let's just do it and we'll get law week out. I don't know when, but we could try. Okay, so that was law. And then two things at the bottom here. The editor was against the idea of killing Ace in Marineford. And I could see that definitely because, especially after just revealing that Ace is Roger's son, you think there's got to be a lot more stuff to this. We got to learn more about Ace now. Like, Ace is, like, destined for greatness because Roger is his dad, you know? And then it's like, I'm going to kill him. And the editor's like, what? That feels like something that maybe Oda had to really push for. That feels like something to me that, like, and once again, I'm just going off of my assumptions here, my headcanon on this. I have no idea how it really went down. It might have just been, like, the editor being like, hey, Oda, I really don't think you should kill Ace. And Oda's like, I, I really want to do that in the narrative and the story. And the editor might have just been like, okay, you know, it's your manga. Or it could have been something that was more heated or not maybe necessarily heated, but maybe a lot more pushback. Like, I really don't think you should do that. He's a really popular character. Be like, I got to do it. I got to do it for Luffy's character it, it, to develop it further. Like, I have to do this. Like, I'm not sure. He's like, you can't really unring this bell. I'm like, yeah, but I got to do it anyway. And so it might have been something like that. Um, but yeah, Ace dying the where, the where he did. The fact that there's so little death in the One Piece story and the fact that when death does happen to a character like Ace of how ultimately powerful it is, once again, he Oda does not drop that hammer very often, but when he does, it's used at crucial points in the story that really leave a lasting impression. After One Piece concludes, in the year 2855, but no, when One Piece concludes in like probably the next five years or so, or less, and I will probably inevitably sit down to make a video that's like, my 10 favorite or 10 most iconic moments in all of One Piece from chapter one all the way up to the very, very end, because I'll probably make that video. Ace's death is going to be on that list. I can guarantee you right now. Not only is it going to be on that list, it's going to probably be on the top five of that list easily. Unless so many cool things happen from this point on where it's like, okay, 10 most iconic moments in One Piece. Number 10, Ace's death. That's how much cooler this shit gets later on. You know, but maybe it, it's definitely going to be in top five right now. I can guarantee it. Uh, and then finally, the last thing here is that Oda already had a plan that Kuma would break up the Straw Hats later when he was introduced. Okay. Now, I originally assumed that was when Kuma appeared at Thriller Bark. And I was like, oh, well, obviously, because Thriller Bark takes place right before Saba Odi when they do separate them. But then I remembered, oh, wait, no, Kuma was introduced early. He was introduced the same time Doflamingo was, right after Alabasta. So if we're talking all the way back then, then I think in that case, Kuma was a character that o Oda already had a good in intent of... Uh, so in that case, I think it was like Oda already had kind of established Kuma, like... I feel like Kuma's entire story, Oda kind of already had at the beginning. He's just one of those characters that really, um, it just really screams that to me. Like, this was a character that Oda really wanted to deep dive into his, like, psyche and his, like, backstory at some point. And we're still going to get that, right? And also that ties in with Bonnie. Maybe the connection between Kuma and Bonnie wasn't always there, but I feel like Oda already always had an idea for Kuma. But anyway, yeah, so thanks again to Sandman AP for this post. Uh, once again, go give him a follow over on Twitter. He's a really cool dude. Um, you know, for extra One Piece news involving interviews with Oda himself or with editors or anything really kind of like um, tangential from the actual manga that doesn't get released in like the Tonko Bonds itself, Sanmei AP is usually there for that. So thanks, man. And thanks for watching this video, everybody. Uh, make sure to go out. Oh, yeah, I still got to do Elephant Facts. I do have Elephant Facts. But yeah, make sure to leave me comments on um, Law of Week videos and we can maybe work something out for 2022. All right, so here we go. Anyway, 
elephant facts. Woo! This is part two of element of uh, element element elephants. Oh my god. Oh my god. I'm gonna incorporate that into a D and D campaign. Elemental elephants. Here's an elephant that's like a fire elemental. I'm 100% incorporating that into a D&D campaign I'm working on right now. Okay. But anyway, more importantly than that, we have elephant mating rituals part two. Okay. So this was some added stuff. So last time I said that elephants, male elephants, bull elephants, go into this state of moose, of a must or whatever. Okay. It's like this uh, really intense moment of like testosterone. It's like their mating ritual kind of situation. Okay. But no, it gets even weirder than the fact that they cry a lot and they also pee a lot. No. So in this one picture I showed in the last video, um, it seems like, yeah, they're crying from their eyes, but also you see this weird goo coming off of the side of their head. And I wasn't sure what that was, and I had to look into that, and some people commented about it, so thank you. So, elephants have, like, a temporal, like, opening on the side of their head, like, in their temple. I don't know if, like, a lot of animals have that. I, I know humans don't. At least I don't think we have openings in our temple. But anyway... Um, there's like an opening there, and when these bull elephants go into this state of must, then this opening begins to secrete like a thick, viscous, like tar-like substance. It's mostly made up of cholesterol and various proteins, but it has like this thick kind of goo that comes out of the elephant's like head. And by the way, it's said on the Wikipedia page that according to humans, it tastes very foul, which means at some point, for science, I hope, somebody had to literally take this elephant secretion tar goo and then taste it. And they're like, yeah, it's not very good. It's not very tasty, in fact. It's like, okay, well, that is documented. We know that now. Okay, so I feel bad for that person. I Hopefully it was only one person that had to drink the elephant goo or, like, taste the elephant goo. Um, but anyway, no. So it's just a thing that happens when they're in this state. And this is honestly the reason why they're aggravated as much as they are. Because with this tar goo coming off the side of their temples, it also eventually reaches their mouths. And then when elephants taste it, we don't know if they would, like, they respond differently to it than humans do. But when they taste it, it also increases, like, their t levels of testosterone and their, like, aggravation increases because of that. Also, the fact that this goo is coming off of their heads also leads to, like, them having acute tooth pain. You know, it's kind of like, have you ever had, like, a really bad headache or, like, the flu sometimes where it feels like your teeth are hurting? It's a weird kind of thing, but it's, like, involving your sinuses and stuff. So when an elephant is in this state of, like, must, they begin to cry, they begin to piss all over the place, and their skulls begin to secrete this goo that gets into their mouth, tastes like shit, and then also makes them feel like they have intense tooth pains to the point where they'll actually take their tusks and, like, 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 basically basically shovel the ground to try to like ease the pain oh my god right being in the state this is all they have to do in order to mate all male elephants go into this state like they're mating rituals okay imagine if every single time that happened to humans oh my god that would be hell right so yeah that's um elephant mating rituals part two hope you enjoyed the video now I'm going to eat this banana. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to eat the banana. Bye. Later, everybody. Check out Sam NAP on Twitter.